Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, family. Welcome to the Mental House with me, your illustrious host, Khadija. Um, I'm not going to be on here because it's quite early in the morning and I wasn't able to sleep because, um, you know, I just want to share this with you guys, family. And when we talk about living with narcissists and liars and people who gaslight you and project their madness onto you um and then you find out a little later uh, that everything that they've told you has been a lie and that's basically what i think about the narcissism um collective narcissism of us as a country it um it just it's it's mind-boggling and what I wanted to do is I just wanted to share something real quick with you guys about the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Because a lot of us think, um, I should say y'all, because the first time I heard this story, I was about, I was in my 20s. And you guys know I'm in my 50s now. So, but the first time I heard this story, uh, young people, um, let me say this. I couldn't repeat it no more because my dad told me to keep my mouth shut. And uh, not to say anything else about this because he didn't know if it was true or not. But here we are over three decades later. And um, I want to share this with you. The revelations are stunning. The media indifference is predictable. Thanks to a nearly four decade investigation by human rights lawyer William Pepper, it is now clear once and for all that Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered in a conspiracy that was instigated by then FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover and that also involved the U.S. military, the Memphis Police Department, and the Dixie Mafia crime figures in Memphis, Tennessee. These and many more incredible details of the King assassination are contained in a trilogy of volumes by Pepper culminating with the latest and final book on this subject, The Plot to Kill King. He previously wrote Orders to Kill King in 1995, and then he wrote An Act of State in 2003. With virtual no help from the mainstream media and very little from the justice system, Pepper was able to piece together what really happened on April 4th, 1968 in Memphis, right down to who gave the order and who supplied the money. And the paste, the patsy was chosen. How the patsy was chosen, and who actually chose pull the trigger. Without this information, the truth about King's assassination would have been buried and lost to history. Witnesses would have died off, taking their secrets with them. And the official lie that King was a victim of a racist lone gunman named James Earl Ray would have just remained a fact. See, but. Let me tell y'all who think that we are we're so paranoid. Uh, here's what makes us that way. Because after we're killed um, months later or years later, the true story comes out about why and how you killed us. I mean, it's just insane. Uh, and not just us. Look at James Earl Ray who was pulled into this conspiracy and took a fall for a murder that he did not commit. I mean, anyway, we know that a member of the Memphis Police Department fired that fatal shot and that two military sniper teams that were part of the 902, 902nd uh, Military Intelligence Group were sent to Memphis as backups should the primary shooter fail. We have access to the fascinating account of how Depper, Dr. Pepper I mean of how Pepper came to meet Colonel John Downey a man in charge of the military part of the plot and Lyndon Johnson's former Vietnam briefer. We also learned that as a part of the operation photographs were actually taken of the shooting and that Pepper came very close to getting his hands on those photographs. Unfortunately the mainstream media has ignored all of these revelations and continues to label Ray as the lone assassin, assassin of Dr. King. In fact, 
Pepper chronicles in detail how a disinformation campaign, kind of like the DOS bots, um, instead of acknowledging that there's a political campaign on the move called Descendants of Slaves, they want to call us bots. Anyway, uh, this information campaign has featured the most collaboration of any mainstream journalist over almost a half a century. He says that he suspects that those orchestrated in the cover-up, which continues to this day, are no longer concerned with what he writes and about the subject. Because they basically don't give a damn now. You know, who cares? These young white people uh, that's involved now or uh, black people that's continuing to cover it up, they're all infidels and riffraffs. They don't care. I'm really basically harmless, I think, to the power structure, Pepper said in an interview. I don't think I threatened them, really. The control of the media is so consolidated now that they can keep someone like me under wraps, undercover forever. This book will probably never be reviewed seriously by mainstream. The story will not be aired in mainstream. They control the media. And it was bad in the 60s, but now it's nowhere near as bad now. That's why I did that uh, video the other day, letting y'all know that we have no, anything that we listen to uh, from this media, media, media is basically lies. And there, it's a clandine, clandestine operation to keep us misinformed. And it's just like the good people should understand this. And the people who have a um, uh, 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 foresight, it, it 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 should awaken you to a point where you know you can't believe nothing that you hear that come out of that mainstream media. You really can't, unless it's a stupid story like, "Oh, we found the dog today," and he almost because aesthetically there's nothing behind that to probably cover up. And then you got to watch that story. The most stunning revelation in the plot to kill King which some may question because the account is secondhand, is that King was still alive when he arrived at St. Joseph's Hospital, which is the hospital I was born in, and that he was killed by a doctor who supposedly to be trying to save his life, which I believe. That is probably the most shocking aspect of the book, the final revelation of how this great man was taken from us, Pepper says. By the way, when I quote Pepper as saying, having said something, I mean in our interview, as if I'm quoting from the book. And let me indicate that. The hospital story was told to Pepper by a man named Jonathan Shelby, whose mother, Lula Mae Shelby, had been a surgical aide at St. Joseph's that night. Shelby told Pepper the story of how his mother came home that morning after the shooting. She hadn't been allowed to go home the night before and gathered the family together. He remembers her saying to them, I can't believe they took his life. She described Chief of Surgery, Dr. Bring Bland, entering the emergency room with two men in suits. Seeing doctors working on King, Bland commanded, Stop working on that nigga. Let that nigga die. Now all of you get out of here. Right now. Everybody get out. Johnson Shelby says his mother described hearing the sound of the three men sucking up saliva into their mouth and then spitting. Lula May described to her family that she looked over her shoulder as she was leaving the room and saw that the breathing tube had been removed from Dr. King and that Bland was holding a pillow over his head. The book contains the entire deposition given by Johnson Shelby to Pepper so readers can judge for themselves whether they think Shelby is credible as Pepper believes she is. Yes, because truth pressed to the earth will rise. That's an African proverb. It's not a European proverb. We know that truth will prevail um, because we are not to offer a lies. They basically are. In fact, a second invaluable source was Ron Atkins, whose father, Russell Atkins Sr., was a local Dixie Mafia gangster and conspirator in the planning of the assassination, even though he died a year before it took place. Ron told Pepper he had overheard Bland, who was his family doctor, tell his father that if King did survive the shooting, he had to be taken to St. Joseph's and nowhere else, as Pepper describes it. He remembers Bring Bland saying to his father that if he's not killed by the shot, 
Just make sure he gets to St. Joseph Hospital and we make sure that he doesn't leave. Ron, who was just 16 at the time when the shooting took place, was apparently taken everywhere by his father in those days. And he was able to recount many details of what happened as the assassination was planned and carried out.